Welcome, everyone. They're quiet and busy. Yeah, but drink the water. Don't be watering the plants. The plants already have water, okay? The plants already. Welcome everyone this evening. If you are joining me, I am pleased to have you. I know that we all have very busy schedules, especially in the evening, but um, you are in for a treat tonight. If you are joining and you are here for the Fat City, how difficult can this be? presentation tonight, you're in the right place. Um, this is a very um, interactive um, simulation type of presentation. So I'm gonna ask if you guys could please turn your cameras on because we're gonna need to interact with one another. I need to see some faces and um, at some point you will be uh, addressing one another as well. Let me introduce myself. Well, first of all, this is like I said, this is Fat City. And um, Rick Lavoie is the creator of Fat, Fat City. So what you're gonna do today is I encourage you that after this, if you are very if still interested in more that you view his um, video on YouTube. Um, today's presentation will only be a snapshot of the Fat City workshop. So if you view that, um, you will get more out of it. But today we're just gonna do a few things. Uh, my name is Tracy Peyton Perry and I am the SELPA director for the Santa Clarita Valley SELPA. And SELPA stands for Special Education Local Plan Area. Um, our SELPA consists of five school districts, uh, four elementary and one high school district. And my position basically oversees the fiscal programming and compliance for students with disabilities. The Santa Clarita Valley SEPA has over 6,400 students with disabilities, and this is my eighth year in this position. Prior to that, I was a director of student support services for the Cascade Union School District, coordinator of program specialist, and my um, first job was as a school psychologist. So that's my background. In a few minutes, um, we are gonna learn what it's like being a student with a learning disability. But first, I just want to get to know um, each of you that are here with me tonight. So if you don't mind, if we can introduce ourselves, tell me what you actually are doing in school right now or what your major is. Awesome, I see Rosa's hand up. Rosa, if you wanna unmute and introduce, that'd be great. I am currently working on my AA at Fullerton College. And my area of specialty is going to be special education. Oh, great! I am, I am currently taking Braille for oh. my for my future visually impaired students, so I can um, translate my curriculum for them. And I am hopefully going to take sign language in the summer. Oh, Rosa, that is fabulous. I would love for you to get my information at the end and let's keep in touch because I will have a job for you when you're finished. <laughs> Kimberly? Hi, my name is Kimberly. Um, I'm actually attending two colleges right now. I attend Pierce College and Glendale College. I actually have an AA in Death Studies. I am in majoring in Sign Language and Child Development. And those two are like my main goals right now. I would like to work with special need kids, especially with deaf children. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, you two ladies so far are picking one of the most um, highly demanding um, positions right now. You know, it's not gonna be hard to find a placement for a DHH teacher or a DHH itinerant person. So 
you're 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 in a good good position there. And I love people and thank you for wanting to work with our students with special needs. I also just want to call it out straight up. Like in some of these workshops, there's spaces where there's people who have ability to hire. Tracy is somebody who has ability to hire and San, Santa Clarita Valley is not that far from where a lot of people are based. And so I just want to throw it out there when she says, hey, keep my contact and like share your information with me. You want to do that. Um, we actually had a teacher prep student get hired a couple years before they were done with their credential because we knew they were coming down the pipeline with a special ed credential. And so that district already kind of snagged that person before they even had certification. And so um, I just want to make sure that people know when Tracy says that, you listen. So Tracy, at some point, I'm sure you'll include your email um, and then we can make sure they can connect. I see um, Elise has her hand up. Elise, you want to go next? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Elise. Um, I attend Cerritos for elementary um, education. Also want to work with uh, special education. I also took um, sign language as well. And I'm actually a teacher's assistant right now for um, seventh grade special ed. And yeah, that, that's what it is. Okay, Elise. Well, thank you so much. You already have gotten into the field and you already are experiencing what I am getting ready to take you guys through today. So thank you again. Is yeah. there anyone else who'd like to, uh, oh, I think I just heard somebody talk. Please feel free to unmute. Carol, is that you? Awesome. Um, I wasn't talking, but I have my little hand up. Um, my name's Carol Woods and I am a child development major at West Los Angeles College. I am 77 years old, a full-time student, and I eventually want to have a childcare facility in my home. Thank you. We need more of that, Carol, so we appreciate it. Thank you so much, too. You wanna love our babies. <laughs> I do love them. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. So Fat City, what does Fat stand for? It stands for frustration, anxiety, and tension. Again, the creator of this is Rick Lavoy. So if you guys want to go more into detail about this, Rick Lavoy will take you on a journey. So I'm just gonna take you on a small adventure today though. This is gonna be probably one of the more interactive um, type of trainings that you've been involved in. Um, I typically do this in person, so this virtual may be a little bit more of a challenge for me, but we're gonna have a good time this evening, okay? So um, basically what I'm gonna do is take you on a journey and you'll experience the way that a learning disabled student learns. So what I'm gonna do, um, is it telling me something, what is that? You want a live transcript? Someone requesting a live transcript? I, d I didn't see that on my side, but I don't know if they're private messaging you. Um, let me go ahead and get that going. Just give me a second and then we should be good. Okay, I think I just enabled it maybe. Okay, great. Okay, and I don't know if it's being recorded. But yes, to get this start, recorded. okay. So to get this started, I'm just gonna show you guys a brief video.
So a learning disability, again, is a deficit in the brain that affects the processing of information. As you just witnessed in this video, it gave you a short synopsis of students who are struggling and what they actually need. And it's just a quick overview of what we're gonna go over today as well. A learning disability negatively impacts academic functional skills and functional skills. And the student is unable to learn as an average student. So the signs of uh, a, a learning disability, although all children with learning disabilities are different, shows at least three warning signs. They could show it in organization. They can show it in spoken um, or written language as well as memory, physical coordination, concentration, and um, social behavior. In organization, meaning like knowing the, the time and day of the year or managing time, completing assignments, um, like putting things in order. And spoken and written language um, would be like learning and pronouncing words, discriminating between sounds. That's an important one that a lot of people don't know is discriminating between sounds or relating to uh, uh, or writing stories. Memory is just basically remembering things, remembering things like directions, um, learning math facts, learning uh, procedures and, and identifying letters and, and um, naming them. And then physical coordination would be like manipulating small objects and you know, self-help skills, uh, cutting, drawing, writing, climbing, Attention and concentration would be like completing tasks or acting before you think, you know, maybe a little restless, could be daydreaming. Um, and social behavior is like uh, making um, friends and impulsive behaviors. So usually if a student with a learning disability is showing two or three of these signs, most likely they uh, are having some challenges. So these are warning signs. Students with disability must qualify under 13, there are 13 areas that they can be eligible for um, to qualify for special education under IDEA, which is the Individual Disabilities Act. And those areas are autism, deaf and blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, ED, hearing impaired, HI, intellectual disability, ID, multiple disability, MD, orthopedic impairment, OI, OHI, which is um, other health impairment, specific learning disability, which is SLD, speech and language impairment, SLI, traumatic brain injury, TBI, visual impairment, including blindness, which is BI. I have specific learning disability in red because that's the largest disability. So special education, since you all want to be special educators, you already know this, but you know the intent um, of special education is to provide an opportunity for the students to learn and to level the playing field. So we know that many of our students who um, are special needs have um, normal intelligence usually and they just have a processing disorder that's impacting them from being able to achieve academically to the level that they need to. So special education is supposed to provide that platform to remediate and help those help them with those skills. The goal um, is to remediate the deficits. So if a student is, is behind in some area and it's because of a processing disorder, they're gonna help with the processing disorder to help remediate get them caught up with the speech or get them caught up with the, um, the math, whatever areas they may be struggling or having difficulty in. In order for a student to become eligible for special education, they have to have a comprehensive assessment demonstrating impairment adversely affects their educational performance. So just because um, a kid may uh, be performing low in class, but not really, um, uh, it is due to what we'll go over uh, what we call not disabilities. It doesn't necessarily mean they will um, qualify for it. Usually students qualify for special education because they have an impairment that's adversely affecting them educationally. The test must be on all suspected areas of disability. So what does that mean? 
It means a parent comes to you and says, my child has difficulty reading and I would like him assessed in reading. And I noticed that he, when he talks, he has a list. And sometimes I have to repeat myself three or four times. So what did I just do? I just identified three areas of suspected disability, although the parent just came to you and said, I just want my child assessed in reading. That's what that means is that we really have to pay attention to the child. We have to pay attention to the request and we have to look at all areas of suspected disability so that we can make sure that we do a thorough assessment of our students to make sure that they are eligible and that we don't overlook anything. So what's not a disability is um, English language learners. English language learners is, are not, is not a disability. Um, and it can't be regarded as such all too often when the environment is um, not conducive to a linguistic or a cultural need, um, we are likely to refer the student to special education. But schools and districts should have intervention programs and in, in, in things to support our students, our English language learners. So they're not referred for special education. The lack of school is also not uh, an area of disability. Uh, oftentimes you'll see kids who haven't been going to school for years and then the parents bring them into school and they're behind uh, many or multiple um, grade levels or subjects. It's because of lack of school and that doesn't mean that it's a disability. So oftentimes because a student is slow learning or hasn't been exposed, they are referred to special education because they think that they're going to get that extra help. But that's really a general education function. If a kid hasn't been exposed to school or is a lack of school, then we have to have intervention programs to get those kids caught up. Behavior problems. Is a behavior problem a disability? Typically, a behavior problem is not a disability. However, students with disabilities, disabilities may exhibit behavior problems. So it is not a disability. Lack of motivation, lack of effort, not a disability. Kids sometimes just come in and they just don't have the motivation. They uh, don't have, the, they don't put a lot of effort forth and it doesn't mean that it's a disability. Sometimes kids are just slower. Sometimes they just don't wanna work. You, don't, you just never know what it is. So motivation only enables us to do the best that we can do to our ability. So sometimes kids are really doing the best that they can. They're just low. It's interesting, it's Tracy, you have a comment in the chat too from Lily that says learned behavior. Which learned I behavior. Sometimes, you know, it's very Pavlovian and it becomes like controlled and it might seem like one thing. Another thing too is Rosa also put, sadly, some schools don't even offer English learning classes. And so those students can be at a deficit and people don't know what's going on. Also, Elise shared that her inspiration for wanting to become a special education teacher is because that um, she was an RSP from third grade to 12th grade and wants to go back and impact the next generation of students. You know what, I am, I'm getting chills all over just listening to you guys. I have a great audience right now and you are gonna love this because you guys are all over this and you are the main people that we need in this field because you are spot on. If they don't have EL programs, then you know that they district should have it. And that's where you might be more instrumental in being able to fight for your students and advocate for them for the need for what they actually need. So th these are fabulous questions. Thank you guys for putting um, questions and in, in, in comments in the chat. I appreciate it. We also have a hand up too already too. Alexandra just put her hand up a moment ago too. When you're, when you're ready for it, Tracy. I'm ready for it. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, my question is, what is the difference between an intellectual disability and a special learning disability. And what is that special learning disability? Because I did see that um, you had it highlighted in red. So I was kind of curious, like what is the difference between those two? I'll explain it now and then it's gonna really be explained when we go through the presentation. But an oh. intellectual disability in the olden days, that used to be called mentally, dis mentally retarded, it used to be called MR. Mm -hmm. change that, rearthorize that to intellectual disability. So that's based off of your cognition being in the low range of, in the um, intellectual disability range. 
SLD, which is a specific learning disability, that's different. That's more like a, a psychological processing disorder. So when I went over those, I'll go over the basic psychological processing disorders, and then you'll get a better understanding of that. Okay, thank you. The other thing is inadequate instruction. We all know inadequate instruction is not a disability. Somebody already said, again, that the, our EL kids are not getting what they need, right? So when they're not getting what they need, a lot of times teachers are really just, you know, I need help, I need help for this student. And they wanna go any avenue they can. And they, you know, special ed is, is the first place they wanna put them, but it's not the best place. And it, it, it can't be due to lack of instruction. Also cultural and socioeconomic disadvantage is not. You know, there are a lot of um, families that are not culturally and not socially economic advantaged as um, some others. And just because they haven't had that exposure and that in, in, in enriched environment doesn't mean that it's a disability because meaning they do have the cognition and once they're exposed and they're taught, then they can grasp. So now that you know what are not disabilities, here's your question. What are specific learning disabilities? Well, this is the definition. A disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language spoken or written that may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, and do mathematical calculations. So a child with a specific learning disability is one who does not meet ex expectations for academic performance in school, but has intelligence, that ID that you asked me about, in the normal range. A severe discrepancy between achievement and intellectual ability in one or more of the following area, areas is what will qualify a student for special education. Oral expression, listening comprehension, written expression, basic reading skills, reading comprehension, mathematical calculations, and mathematical reasoning. Within those areas, these are the psychological, the basic psychological processes, sensory motor skills, visual processing, auditory processing, attention, cognitive abilities, association, conceptualization, and expression. Processing. Students with LD have difficult time processing information. When a teacher asks a student without a learning disability, they will process the answer. But when a student with a learning disability, they did first have to process the question and then the answer. So if I were to say, and, and excuse me if I pronounce anybody's name wrong, but if I were to say, um, Theo, what sound does a horse make? Nay. Renee, what sound does a cat make? Meow. Kimberly, what sound does a horse make? Nay. Carol, give me a name of a story with a cat in it. And the cat in the hat. Elise, give me the name of a story with a cat in it. <laughs> God, I don't know. Kimberly, give me a name of a cat with a, with a story with a cat in it. Um, Puss in Boots. Fail. Give me a, a story with a name of a cat in it. Cat in the Hat. Carol, give me a name of a story with a cat in it. Um, oh, what's another one? I can't think of another one right come now. Come on, come on, think a little bit harder. Oh my, a story with a cat. A name with a story with a cat in it. Oh, um, oh, what is it? Pizza so cat. I, I'll stop there. That was, the just, that was just an activity, just to show you when you're in class and you're asking a student with a learning disability, not saying you guys have learning disabilities, I sped this activity up to make it feel like you had it because you have to think on the spot. That's the kind of pressure that an LD student would be experiencing. So a non-disabled student 
process the answer where the learning disabled processes the question. For an example, if we take a fourth grade class and we say, who was the first president of the United States? The non-disabled student would be able to answer that because they are processing the question. The learning disabled student is still processing who, hmm, it's gotta be a person because it's who, was means that they're dead. So they're still processing, they're taking twice as long. So that was just a, a brief activity just to show you what it, it's like when you're asking students with disabilities in the classroom questions. You have a question in the chat and there's actually one from earlier as well, but do you advocate for the words not yet? And I was thinking like one of the things I used to use in my class all the time is I'd go, oh, we're gonna give some think time. And I always use the phrase think time. Mm -hmm. So at any point a student knew that they could go, oh, I need some think time. And I go, oh, well, do you want to wait or do you want us to come back to you? So then they had a chance to like extend the think time if they right. need longer. So, okay. but um, what about this here? Like, do you use the phrase not yet? I see some other hands up too. So what, love your thoughts on that. I've never used the phrase not yet, but you do want to ease the student. So how I just kept going on and asking, you know, Carol and asking, you know, the different people and they were having, they were trying to think, I didn't, I didn't show patience. So how, whatever that way of showing patience for the student and saying, okay, we'll come back to you. Oh, that's okay, you know, but instead I just, come on, think a little harder, you know, you just, you make them feel, you know, so whatever you think you can use, that's gonna make them feel comfortable. Tracy, I've literally heard teachers say, think a little harder. Think, yes. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that example because as that child, that must be so frustrating when you're like thinking as hard as you can and then right. you hold that. Mm -hmm. Did you have, you had another question? Um, I see both Rosa and Thao have their hand up. And Thao, I wanna make sure that I'm saying your name correctly too. So please correct us if um, if I'm wrong or if um, Tracy's wrong and um, when you come off mute. So who would like to go first? Uh, I can go first there. Um, this is uh, the question in your previous slides, not, not the, um, uh -huh. uh, where you brought the word deficit. And I just wanted to, um, uh, more like comment as well as a question here is, uh, you know, why why do we um, perceive these kids in special education as kids with deficits? Because you know we have kids that are twice exceptional and they are also in special education. They may have um, they're very gifted, but they also have ADHD. Uh, I think that we need to not adopt this medical view of disability, where this this view sees uh, disability disability as a deficit, but embrace more of a social view of disability where the social view on disability sees um, disability as, uh, as I'm sorry, see uh, where society sees um, the need to adapt to the needs of, of those with disabilities. So basically the medical model sees a um, you know, person with disability as, okay, this person has a problem, we try to fix the problem. Whereas somebody that has a social view on disability sees as, okay, um, person is a wheelchair. Um, we should not try so hard to fix that person, but try to have a, have, um, feel like a, um, a ramp or, um, you know, accommodations. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, have the, um, the structures in place to that we work for, them, uh, work for them, not have them work, uh, meet the norms of the society. So, um, that's just, so I, I just noticed that special ed has been very much centered on this view on deficits when the model should be shifted towards social. Yeah, and you know, they'll, um, I, I'm not sure how well you are familiar with Ed Code, and so you are pretty spot on. Um, uh, in fact, this presentation that I'm doing is, is pretty much like out of the 70s. So there's some terminology that sounds pretty ancient in it, and um, but it's very relevant. So if you were to view the video, you would probably hear a lot of terminology that we no longer use. But unfortunately, right now in Ed Code, they still use that because um, they haven't reauthorized you know, IDEA in years. So until that reauthorization comes up, then um, that's when that terminology would change. But I know that us as educators, I never really go in and say that the student has a deficit. Now I may refer to a, 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 a psychological processing disorder um, as what is hindering them and where they might need some accommodations or some modifications, but I never really address it that way. So I'm just giving you pretty much the ed code of what's, what it is, but I understand what you're talking about, that paradigm shift where in phrasing needs to, needs, to, needs to occur. Yeah, definitely, because uh, the 
that this model um, is not a good model to use when it comes to um, speaking of, of those with disabilities. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, I am a, a, a school psychologist by trade, and we have always used um, a discrepancy between them. And now we're looking at patterns of, of uh, strengths and weaknesses, and that's what we're looking toward. So eventually, um, the law will catch up with what's happening in the practices that are going on in the schools. So distraction and um, attention span, most common misperceptions of students with learning disabilities um, is using this word interchangeably because a student with a learning disability pays attention to everything and can't focus. But a student with an uh, attention span pays attention to nothing. That's important to know. So they're often used interchangeably, but they're not. For a student um, with an LD, it's difficult for them to process information as they are also nervous. So, because they put a lot of energy into concentrating on lectures and things. So, you know, while they're sitting there and they're listening or they're writing or doing whatever task that they're supposed to do, they're being distracted by maybe a kid tapping their pencil or something. It's really, and they're really trying to focus. That's a student with a learning disability. They're trying. It's just that it's other things that are impacting that. So a technique that's, that teachers sometimes can use is just, you know, to take some of that nervousness out, that anxiety, that A in fat city, that A, that anxiety. To walk up to the, the student and stand close to them. Ask them questions that they know. Build up their confidence, you know, and then eventually you'll start to see them raise their hand on their own. So there are different techniques and strategies and things that teachers can do, use to help make students feel more comfortable. Visual processing is a way that we understand information from our eyes. And learning disabilities affecting this can affect the accuracy of what is seen, memory of what's seen, understand what's seen, or figure ground discrimination. And the way that we follow a line on a text on a page can also be affected, and that's called uh, visual tracking. So this is the process for visual processing. You receive the information through your eyes, you process that information, and you connect it to something to associate it. Then when you're speaking, you get ready to recall it so that you can retrieve it and express it. There's a breakdown here sometimes within this process for uh, students who have visual processing difficulties. Visual perception is the ability to identify, organize, and interpret sensory data received by an individual through the eyes. There are several areas. After this, we're gonna do uh, activity. There's several areas of visual perception. <clears throat> the first one is visual motor, which is the ability to relate visual stimuli to motor responses in an inappropriate way. So visual motor would be eye-hand type of coordination type of things. Building blocks, uh, tracing, writing, uh, drawing, cutting. Those are, those are what visual motor would be. Then there's visual, figure ground, and that's the ability to visually attend to a designated stimulus that and not be distracted by the background. So there's sometimes there's things that students may see or you may see that you don't think that is a disruption or um, interfering with what a student is looking at. And that's because they have difficulty with the figure ground, the stuff that's in the background. Visual discrimination is the ability to discern the similarities and differences visually. Visual memory is the ability to store and retrieve information that has been given to a visual stimuli. So, you know, we play those memory games with our, our kids when, when they're young, right? We need to continue playing memory games, continue to develop and strengthen those skills. Visual closure is the ability to identify a visual stimulus from the incomplete visual presentation. A lot of times this is what's gonna help um, affect students when they're trying to read. They can't do the visual closure. You know, if you're reading a story to a kid and you say the cat and the, they should be able to say hat. A lot of times they, they can't do that. They don't know what that is. Visual tracking is the ability to track one's eyes, hands from left to right, and then in an efficient manner. It enables the task to be completed quick, quickly. Then we have visual integration, which is the ability to integrate all the above areas with the vision system together to gain a meaning of the visual stimuli. 
So here's our activity. I don't want you to um, shout this out at all, but I do need you all to take your mics off because I'm gonna ask you questions. I just want you to say yes or no. That's all I want is just yes or no. Ready? You guys take your, your mics off. Unmute everybody. Unmute. Okay. What is this? Do you know what this is, Rosa? Do you know what this is? It's uh no, it I didn't like say no, you're supposed to say yes or no. You don't oh, tell me what yes. it is. Do you know what this is? Yes. No. no. Okay. Do you know what this is? No. Maria, do you know what this is? No. Yes. Okay. Renee, do you know what this is? No. Look at it harder, folks. Is it a shadow? I promise if you get it right, we can end early. <laughs> Not happening. If you guys don't get this right, then you know I, I would have candy, but I can't give you your candy. Yes. Yes. It's a witch. It's a cow. <laughs> You're not trying hard enough. It's a cow or a witch? <laughs> okay, who said cow? I did. Maria is right. It's a cow. I don't see it. <laughs> so it is a cow that's facing kind of to oh. the left. You'll see the nose towards the end of the page, but the body where you see those dots, that's the, the body turning. So the face is all the way on your left side. Do you see that? Tracy, can you take your cursor to show where the face is? This is the face. And this is the nose. Whoops. There's the eyes. It's looking at you. Oh, oh wow. And the body is over this way. <laughs> now I see it. That's now you see it? Okay. Yeah. Look how long that took non-disabled yeah. people to figure out. <laughs> Just imagine when a student who is struggling and we are trying to move on and they still haven't gotten it. I would have just skipped it. Like, I don't want it. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to deal with it. I mean, well. but then again, I, I was in RSP, so they wouldn't, my teachers would have known that I was going to skip it. <laughs> if I could not get it, I'm not doing it. Y'all, I need a modification. And the modification is I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> um, yes. Trish, you've got a that question was always chat me. too. I don't know if you want to take it right now or maybe later, but Rose is asking about how, what are your thoughts on the introduction of devices? Is that something hurting children's development? So if at some point you could reflect on that, that would be great. Sure, we can come back to that, Rosa, if you wanna ask me later. Okay. So the visual perception problems of students with disabilities make it difficult um, for them to immediately understand what they are looking at. This problem is exaggerated by teachers who urge students with SLD to say, try harder, which is what I did, right? to understand what he or she is having trouble making sense of or, or do a bribe, like I just said, you know, we get in early if you get this or even threaten a student by withdrawing to take recess or blaming them and by accusing a student of not trying hard enough. These are the things that we do where we diminish the self-esteem of students with special needs because they are struggling and we're not identifying with their uh, disability. So seeing versus perceiving. Students with um, learning disability need direct instruction. So a, a better way I could have showed that picture and said, this is a picture of an animal. You know, give them some type of sense of something, you know, to go by to, to strengthen that. They can see things when you show it to them uh, of what things are. So right after I told you it's a cow, and if we were doing this in person, I have an overlay and it goes on top of it and it really, you can really see the cow even better. Um, then they're able to, to do it. They need trained, experienced teachers to show them this. And the real experience of a learning disabled is being the only one in the room who can't do it. So when somebody shouted that this is a, a, a witch or whatever, uh, or, or and then even a cow, which it was a cow, and nobody else got the cow. That was the only person that got it. But can you imagine if everybody got it and said it was a cow, except for one person, 
that's that one learning disabled student in the classroom and how they feel. So the effects, the effects of um, visual perception on behavior. Do you think that visual perception can cause behavior problems? So in the beginning, I said, what's not a, what's not a disability? I said, behavior is not a disability. However, visual processing is. And if a student is stressing out, full of anxiety or getting frustrated because they can't identify that picture and they're getting pressure placed on them by saying, hurry up, try harder, you're not doing it, you know, they're gonna act out, exhibit behavior issues. Many times the child perceive, perception of a situation is different than your own. A child reacts to the stimulus they perceive. Ask questions to ensure you are seeing the same thing. So. If a kid did something, it's, they, sometimes it's not naughty. Sometimes that's what they thought. So make sure you clarify, you ask, and you teach them what they did or, or didn't do right. Here's another activity. In the chat, write a nice title for this picture in the chat. So I'm going to say, I don't know who this one is, um, A-L-E-Gendra. You said skull, ladies. Now, if I were in person and I was doing this, I would probably take it because I tell you to write it down on a piece of paper and I'd probably take it and rip it up and just show you or whatever and say, this is a beautiful woman looking in a mirror. And you're telling me that it's frustration and anger or a skull and, you know, all of these things. But this is a, a, a creepy woman with a skull. <laughs> that's what I saw. But that's okay. <laughs> but that's exactly. <laughs> I love that the, literally it's like, I'm like looking at these people, what people have said. And it's like, these could be like movie titles. The Evil Within Me. Part the of the Evil Within Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is just a, a, another perception. See, what you see is not the same thing that a child would see. The effects of a, a visual perception on behavior, often the child gets into trouble and doesn't know what he or she did wrong. Misperception of visual stimuli can lead the student with SLD to give incorrect answers or respond inappropriately to situations. So you guys responded inappropriately to that beautiful woman looking in a mirror, and you're going to get in trouble for it. You know, so it's just a misperception. Here's reading comprehension. SLD students have trouble with reading comprehension, even if they know and recognize individual words within a sentence. They may be dyslexic or they may not have a grasp on the background information required to understand what they are reading. According to international reading associations, 95% of textbooks and 93% of teachers teach comprehension through vocabulary. They find the words a child has difficulty which, with, teach them those words and assume that they will be able to understand a story. The theory is that if you are able to understand every word in a passage, then you'll be able to understand the passage. Is this true? this true? No. Let's try it. Do you know the words on this list? Do you guys know all the words on this list? People are responding yes. in the chat so far. Yes. It looks like everybody's saying yes. Okay. So I can make the assumption that you understand every word on this list that you can understand this paragraph. 
If the known relationship between the variables consists of a table of corresponding variables, the graph consists only of the corresponding set of isolated points. If the variables are known to vary continuously, one often draws a curve to show the variation. Do you agree? I don't even understand what you read. Does anybody understand what I read? Is that the bell curve? No. Good try. Good try. Now let's read this one silently while I try to read it out loud to you. Last serenity, Flippadolpy and Fairbian were in the nerd link, triple gloppy gloops and gleaming blurpy glips. Suddenly, a ditzy streusel boofed in Flippadolpy thrifts. Flippian blacked and blacked. Oh, Flippadolpy, he, sh he shifted. This dizzle strizzle is turning up your grip. Now, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. When did this take place? Last Cerny. Last Cerny. Who was blingled up? Where were they? Nerdling. What type of capsules? Gloopy. What did they expect? Where did it boof? Into the flinga, flinga dopes. So this is just an example of, I gave you a passage just before this where you knew every word in that passage and you had no idea what that passage was about. And this one, you don't know hardly any of these words, but you guys were able to answer questions. Is that unique? So again, teaching to vocabulary doesn't necessarily mean comprehension. Oral expression is the inability to retrieve stored linguistic information in a way that others can is called dysnomia. You can help with this problem by giving the learning disabled student more time to answer and respond to questions. So associative and cognitive versus cognitive. You can only do one cognitive thing at a time, but you can do two or more associative things like drive and talk at the same time. So speaking to speaking is a cognitive process for a student with dysnomia. They have a hard time taking notes because listening is a cognitive process. Again, that's two things at one time, two cognitive things at one time that they can't do. Word finding is what they struggle with. So if they're trying to speak and they're trying to listen, they can't find the words. Oftentimes students who have dysnomia, what they do is they, they memorize it and then they put it in a storage. And then when it's time to retrieve it, they lost it somewhere in that storage. They don't know how to find it. So they struggle and it takes a longer time for them to process. So reading and decoding, SLD students, are often dyslexic and they cannot decode information as quickly as others. So what we'll do is we will look at this uh, video real quick and then maybe we might wanna take a break or I can keep going, it'll be up to you guys.
So now that I've gotten you dizzy, what I would like for you to do is go ahead and take a, a few minutes break. Um, but when you come back, if you can come back with a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. Mommy, no. For this next exercise. Tracy, just so you know, we have people in the chat that are saying keep going. So is it cool if we do maybe like a two minute break? So that oh, a quick one? We can keep, I can keep going now. Unless you got three people that are saying keep it going. Oh, keep it going. Okay. And if anybody needs to take a personal break, like just, you know, mute, go off camera, use the restroom or grab a drink, whatever you need to do. But um, if you're okay with it, Tracy, the, the group's already there. I'm okay. Thank you time. for being so engaging, you guys. I love it because <laughs> I'm all, oftentimes I don't know how to stop. So here's my simulation for dyslexia now, after you have already viewed that video. If you have your piece of paper and your pencil, um, great. If you don't, please make sure you get one now. There are five sentences with words written backwards. You will have a brief moment of time to decipher them. The answers for each sentence will be given right after the lapse time. Does everybody have their paper and pencil? Ready? Wow. Okay. Wow. Anybody get it? And when we know it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Some of us are like geeky logic puzzle people who love stuff like this. Okay. Go ahead. Rosa. The black cat climbed the tree. The black cat climbed the tree. Here we go. Next. Okay, Renee. She played fetch with the dog. Yep. Now okay. this is fun for me because I like logic puzzles. That's I okay. can't imagine consistently Keep. reading like this as a child though. It'd be exhausting. Keep going, yes. We wanted to go swimming at the lake. Very good. Thank you. You need to study for your history test. Okay, you guys are on a roll. Somebody in the chat put that Wordle is helping out too. <laughs> Those who play Wordle. He wanted to walk. No, wait, he walked. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Alexandra, you've got it. He walked. He walked to the park with his friends. There you go. <laughs> so how do you guys think you all did on all of them? I know some people shouted out the answer, but did anybody really struggle with this? I I got like some of, I'm not good at words. So like I got maybe like the first word of every one of them. And then after that, it just went downhill for me. And that's okay. Cause this was just an exercise again to show how students with dyslexia struggle. It is how much mental effort it takes. I can honestly say I did struggle a little as you can tell um, because it did take a lot of mental strength. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really good at these. Right. Yeah, well, that's that's how the, the learning disabled student ha is, you know, and this is, like I said, again, this was an activity that is not an exact simulation of dyslexia, but is to help you understand the amount of effort it may take for someone with dyslexia to decode or process words. Another activity. Write down these sentences using your non-dominant hand. Okay, your non-dominant hand. Ben went to the store for milk. P 
Peter studied for his science test. Jim asked, where is my pencil? Given a list of two syllable second grade words containing short vial, vowels, Debbie without prompting will be able to decode those words with 95% accuracy. Did you all get those? Reaction to this, how did that make you feel? Anybody? Melinda put in the chat, I can't keep up. I didn't feel, I personally felt like stupid. I see Rosa's hands up. Rosa, Rosa, do you wanna share what you put in the chat? Cause I think that's interesting. I had to stay out of it. I, I know because of my accident, I learned how to write with my non-dominant hand. So it was kind of unfair for everybody else, I think, because I can write with both hands now. Oh, I'm a dentist. Okay. <laughs> you could have tried it, though, because I might have said them too fast and you still couldn't get it all down. So, but that's okay. So basically, this is just another, another simulation of showing how um, students can become frustrated because they can't keep up. Auditory processing refers to the uh, difficulty in comprehending speech. Auditory processing di disorder is when the ears process speech correctly, but something interferes with the brain's processing and it interprets the sounds different. So remember, visual processing was with the eyes and it coming out differently. Now we're listening to it and it's something is interfering and it's, it's um, interfering with the processing. The ability to process verbal large sounds it's a glitch from the hearing sound to the brain's ability to decode, interpret, and remember those sounds. So being able to interpret the sounds and then put a meaning to it makes it difficult for kids. So that's why it's hard to do the auditory. They may hear it and listen, but then when it's time for them to regurgitate and put it back out, something changed in there when it got to the brain that made it not be able to process it auditorily. So areas and symptoms, communication, Background noise, a lot of times people can't hear with a lot of background noise. Attention, again, we talked about the distractible child where they're trying to pay attention and they can't pay attention because they're being distracted by other things. Thinking, behavior, and following directions. You know, when we always say, can a child follow a two or three step direction? Sometimes you have to give them one step at a time or you have to give it to them auditorily and visually. So they might need them both ways in order to be able to um, process that. I have a question. Um, yes. Oh, with all of the auditory um, um, perceptions that you had listed, um, one of them that I didn't see, and I'm wondering, should we, um, is a hearing problem, period. Mm -hmm. Yep. So hearing is one that's, remember, uh, in the specific learning disabilities, it was hard of hearing or hearing impaired, mm -hmm. that was one of the um, categories. So de definitely. So how would we know what to do? Uh, well, you have to have the student assessed. So if you're finding that the student is having difficulty hearing, then they will be referred for an audiological ex exam. So the, the school nurse will probably do a basic hearing test. And then if it, was, if it needed to go further, then would they, districts do have audiologists. And the audiologist would also do it. Now, if it's a, a truthful medical issue, usually you bring it to the parent's atti attention and the parents will take that child to their pediatrician and then they go forward from there. Mm. But we do have support in the school system for students who uh, are hearing impaired. So an auditory perception is the ability to identify, organize, and interpret sensory and data received by an individual through hearing. 
So these are areas, and this will probably hit some of the areas that you're talking about too, are areas of auditory perception. So when you have auditory perception, you have um, auditory discrimination, and that is the ability to discriminate between words that are similar or different in the way they sound. This can affect the areas of behaviors because if a child can't understand what is being said or what they're being told, then you know um, often they can result in acting out. Um, auditory closure is the ability to combine sounds that are presented orally to make words. So uh, when I see a child um, can't fill in the gaps of the speech, this is what can be challenging for them. Then I gave an example of kind of reading a story to them and then they should be able to follow along like, you know, hickory dickory doc. They should be able to say that. Um, auditory memory is the ability to remember accurately the auditory stimulus. And then auditory visual integration is the ability to accurately relate um, an auditory sound with a visual sound. So it's bringing both of those into play. Auditory figure ground is the ability to auditorily attend to the designated stimulant and not be distracted by the background. That's a tough thing for them to do. And auditory integration is the ability to integrate the above areas, everything, into an auditory system together to gain the meaning from auditory stimulus. Auditory visual coordination is the ability to use hearing and seeing at the same time. So here's an auditory discrimination activity. You're gonna take your pen and paper, your blank, it should be a blank piece of paper. And let me see. I am going to, and then at the end, you are gonna show this, you're gonna hold your paper up. So you're gonna show it to me, everybody. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna give you a set of instructions. Usually when I do this activity, we do it in pairs and you sit back to back with the person and one person gives a direction and the other person is doing the activity but I'm gonna just give the direction and all of you guys are gonna do the activity. So here we go. Towards the middle of your paper, shift it to the right. Draw a squiggly line, diagonally. At the beginning of that squiggly line, at the first hump, draw a triangle. At the tip of that triangle, draw a circle. Above the circle, draw three short lines. Towards the end of that squiggly line, at the second to the last hump, draw a rectangle. Okay, anybody wanna hold their picture up, everybody. Okay, let's see, okay. Anybody else? Okay, okay, this is what it should look like. You guys did pretty good though. I don't know if you can really see mine. Can you see it? It won't let you see it, huh? It's not showing because of the virtual background. It yeah, might... I didn't oh, even wait, know. wait. I, we're almost getting it there. Can you just lift it up a little bit more? It's not it's kind of weird. See if your body can do a con there. Have your body contrast and then lift it. Okay. There we go. Ah, there we are. There we go. <laughs> See it? Oh wow. 
Mine didn't look exactly like that. <laughs> but you, yeah, nobody's really looked like, I mean, looked exactly like it, but you guys were on this. I saw some good squiggly lines and the, the triangle. I saw everything that I said do, so it didn't look bad. But anyway, again, this is a, an auditory scrim and this is kind of like an activity where, you know, you have to hear and listen. And it also involves spatial relations. There's a lot involved here. But mostly what I was trying to demonstrate is auditorily following, um, following directions, okay? So the auditory discrimination uh, activity is, is right here, actually. So this is your next activity. This is going to tell you that you need uh, headphones. You do not need headphones, okay? Tracy, is there sound with this? Because I'm not hearing nope, it. No, not okay. yet. It's kind of trying to give you a, a simulation of what an auditory processing person would be. Now it's going to begin. Listen carefully. There was a boy named Jack and a girl named Jo. They were both brother and sister. They were both instructed by their parents to get some milk at the market since they ran out this morning from eating cereal. Jill put on her blue coat as Jack got his hat. Jack was all ready to go. Eventually she decided and off they began their adventure to the market. Along the way, the dog street and the meat did it. Knowing well that they needed to be home soon before it got too dark out, he left them. Jack comes up and says, Wow. That's a little cool. Jill comments, Yeah, I could just grab the cloud, grab one, and eat it. They finally made it to their time for supper and at the dinner parents about their small adventure to the market. Ready to answer some questions? What was Jill's brother's name? Jack. Yeah. What was the task the children were sent off to do? Go to the market. What color was Jill's coat? Blue. Blue. What did Jack do when he saw the dog on the street? What shape did Jack say the cloud looked like? Were you able to answer them all? No. Those are the five questions. I just put them back up there, but I know that they were difficult to, to follow because, oh, yeah, as you started hearing that background noise, which kids hear when they're in class, this is what happens is that they don't catch everything. They get bits and pieces of what's being said. And then you wonder why, and you say they weren't paying attention is because they're having that auditory discrimination, that bigger ground um, processing disorder. Any questions? Okay. This is not a test or an evaluation for auditory processing disorder that I just went in. It's just an exaggerated simulation to show how it can be hard and how it can be frustrating. Remember fat, 
frustrating anxiety and tension to not get the answer based on normal extreme um, obstructions or circumstances. So not being able to answer the questions is the same thing that you were experiencing. Renee. Tracy, I'm wondering what are the times in school where students have um, hearing tests that happen that are school administrators? At what I know like kinder does it, but I don't know what other grades besides kindergarten have that type of uh, almost like a medical assessment there. You know, I don't really know um, how often I can get that answer pretty easy for you, but I don't off the top of my head, I'm not sure how often because in special ed, we do it when the students are being assessed. So every time they're getting assessed, uh, you know, we're, we're testing for that, that hearing. So you check every, okay, that makes sense. But they're, always, whenever try I'm but, parents, but they're triannuals every, mm -hmm, every three Whenever years. parents have concerns, the first thing I do is I say, have you spoken to your pediatrician? Have you done hearing tests? Have you done That's, vision? Yep. All those pieces. Yes, because you have to rule all of that stuff out first. Yep. Another big issue or big concern is risk taking. We have to build the confidence of our babies. And you guys seem like the perfect educators to do it. I've already heard Rosa earlier talking about it. And, you know, and Thou, how she really says, you know, how we need to change some language and so forth. And risk taking is a huge thing for our kids. Students with learning disabilities, they don't like surprises. Um, they don't want, uh, they won't take chances because typically when they are correct in class, they receive little reinforcement. For an example, when I was testing you guys earlier today, some of you said correct answers and I never congratulated you and said right answer and that was good. That was done intentionally just so that I can go back and relate this to what I'm talking about. They want to build that confidence. They wanna know that they're doing good. So when they see that they're wrong, then the teacher has plenty to say to them. You know, when well, you're not trying hard, you didn't get it right or you know, go sit in the corner or no recess for you. The student with a learning disability doesn't wanna play anymore, they don't wanna you know, answer, they just want to give up. So we have to be, we have to encourage our babies to want to take risk. Sometimes intimidating situations in the classrooms make our students with specific disabilities hesitant to take risks. And this leads to a lack of participation in class or discussions or fear of getting answers wrong, which will, which they will be ridiculed. So they don't want to get embarrassed. And then as a result, this can translate into, into adulthood. So if students with specific learning disabilities developing into adults with SLDs are reluctant to take chances, as a kid, they're gonna be reluctant as an adult. Visual motor integration was the activity that we did also. I was really showing you that for directions in the beginning, but it's also crossing over for difficulties with visual motor coordination. Um, often make the writing process difficult for students with SLD. So on top of them having to follow directions and, and have that eye-hand coordination, that's hard. Another activity you can do is have them draw a picture or you draw a picture, not them, with a mirror in front of you. Try to do that. Then that's a challenge and that's basically kind of the uh, visual motor coordination difficulties that the student is experiencing. And I think what happened was I did my activity out of turn. <laughs> so that last activity that we did where you, where you did the drawing, that was out of turn. So I apologize for that. But the learning disabled student often needs to hear a written passage before they're able to comprehend it. So always give them some, some time in advance. Let them hear it first. You know, expose them to it. This is not an aha, I got you type of thing. If you really want the kid to absorb it and learn it, give them the opportunity. Take the time. Uh, many of these students um, benefit from having books on audio tape, you know, so I talked about the auditory uh, difficulties in processing. You don't want to give that to a student with that. But what about the ones that have visual process and do better auditorily? That might that will, would really help them. And if anything else you don't take away from this, you have to take away fairness. This is the main thing. Fair, equal and fair isn't the same thing. Fairness is not everyone getting the same thing. Fairness means everyone gets what he or she needs. And in order to be fair, the teacher has to treat the student with a learning disability different. They have to have patience. You have to be able to accommodate. You have to be able to understand what that student is going through. 
The real challenge in ed educating those who don't have a learning disability, uh, the real challenge is educating those who don't have a learning disability. Because we know what's going on with the kids with a disability. We just have to be patient with them and give them time. So teachers are urged to re-examine the notion of what is fair. Fair doesn't mean that every child gets the same treatment, but that every child gets what he or she needs. Fair doesn't mean equal. I say that all the time. That's when I said in the beginning of the uh, presentation that we equal the level, playing, level the playing field for our students with special needs. So um, if anything else, that's what I want you to live a day in the life or an hour or so and a half in the life of a student of a, uh, with a learning disability and experience what they are actually going through. So, and I thank you guys for your, for your participation because you're very interactive with it. Um, so thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm here for questions. Excellent, Tracy. Let's start by giving her a round of applause. This is fantastic. I love it. People are like, oh, this is great. This is great. We have Tracy for a little bit longer. If anybody has any questions or any clarity that they need, uh, I'm going to go through the chat right now. But while I'm looking, Lily, I know your hand up before. I know you had your hand up before. I wasn't sure if that was something that you wanted to share or um, not to put you on the spot. But I know you had a. Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask about what, um, what would be a, a child. I don't, you know, because there were certain phrases that you had or certain, um, uh, what is it called again? Word you had LD, SLD. What, a, a specific learning disability? Yeah. What? Oh, so a child that um, knows and has read and knows the 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 words, but when speaking, uh, they they lose what they're trying to say. And very often, where they become frustrated, what would what would that child fit under? That was the that was that's still the um, the auditory processing. That's the dysnomia that I was talking about. That's the word finding. Okay. Yeah, that's them trying to retrieve the words that they've heard. It, it's lost in there somewhere. And so, how can we help a child with that? Oftentimes, well, that's when you you write the IEP for the student and you. Um, figure out what service and related service providers, because most likely that student would probably be assessed also by a speech and language pathologist. Uh -huh. That would also help them be able to learn how to retrieve their words, how to store their words. And then there'll be probably um, uh, activities that you can do to help with retrieval and storage and things like that. And they would be able to um, assist a kid. So you learn how to just kind of accommodate with that. So a mm -hmm. lot of times what we do for ourselves is, you know, sometimes when you can't remember something, we take a sticky and we write it down. Right. We might put it on the refrigerator or on the mirror. And that might be an accommodation for a kid that you might do that has difficulty with word finding because they okay. know what they want to say. They just can't find it at the time that they're trying to say it. And the more the anxiety gets there, the harder mm -hmm. and harder it is for them to find that. Right. So you call it, uh, it's called dys dysnomia? dysnomia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. You're welcome. I know we've got some more questions. If people want to unmute, feel free to. We also have some in the chat. I do want to give a plug also because Tracy's coming back on Thursday night to talk about the variety of careers that are available in special education and she'll probably talk about some of the trends of like, like right now we need speech and language pathologists. Right now there's extra initiatives to help the counselors. Like we want to make sure that everybody knows that information. So Tracy's coming back on Thursday night to share about that. So just mark your calendars and make sure to join us. Um, Tracy, I see here, or actually, Yasmin, um, do you want to, do you have a question or comment that you'd like to um, ask? Whoops. I'm so sorry, I accidentally just muted you and I did not mean to. So please <laughs> unmute. I'm sorry that I did that by accident. I have a question. Yes. I wonder if we ask open-ended questions to the disabled children. If you ask open-ended questions? To disabled children. Well, I, it depends. There's, so, there's a variety of disabilities. So if that's a weakness for that particular child, then you don't want to do that. 
So it just depends on where their, their strength and their weakness is, where their processing disorder is. Okay. So if, the, if it is mental issue, we do not ask, but if it is like uh, physically, yeah, physical, you can. It's probably not, but it's not necessarily even if it's mental. It depends on how, how low, because, you know, there's different um, levels of uh, intellectual ability. So if they are really, really like a, um, a severe type of student, then that probably wouldn't be the best thing to do. Okay, then I can. Yeah, Thank you. you can open, ask open-ended questions to some students with disabilities. The thing is, is that you do have to make accommodations, meaning that you have to give them time. You have to let them process or you have to prompt them some type of way or teach them, you know, so there's not what you can't do is how do you do what you need to do to get what you need to get, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I see Rosa's hands up, Tracy, but, and Rosa, as you unmute, I want to go back to, you have another question in the chat that was from earlier. Um, at 622, she asked if you feel that the district should support with additional training, um, Tracy. Um, so I am a SELPA, and part of my responsibility is to provide professional development to all of the districts in my SELPA. So ongoing training and professional development is necessary. Ongoing. And do and I think your question is more of do we feel that more training is needed for teachers to help develop them, and I do believe it is, and I know that they are working on that too um, in other avenues, as far as um, preparing teachers to go into this field and credential wise, they're they're reshaping that right now so that they can be better prepared, both general ed and special ed teachers, but as far as once they're in the profession. I do provide a lot of professional development to teachers. In fact, this type of presentation I would do oftentimes with um, general education teachers, because when we start doing our mainstream and push in, they don't understand what they're getting in their classrooms. So I walk them through the life of a student with a disability. Thank you so much, Tracy. There's another comment in the chat that I see we have a couple of hands up. Um, and this one was from Rosa also. Do you feel the introduction of devices is hurting children's development? So, You're muted. Oh. Tracy, you're muted. I'm sorry. And I might have not muted myself because I started looking at the chat and then muted you accidentally. I apologize. Okay. That would be a personal um, a type of uh, uh, opinion. Um, but uh, devices are necessary in the world that I work in right now for a lot of students. So I think that overall, Devices can be damaging to kids if it's not monitored and they're not used wisely. Um, however, that's the way that our society and our world is going more towards the electronics and, and those devices. But in the field that I'm in, when you ask me a question like that, oftentimes we do what we call um, assistive technology um, assessments to determine the need for a student. So we're not going to give them a device that's going to hinder them. We're going to give them a device that's going to um, help them. So devices as tools. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see Tao's hand up and Terry's hand and then Rosa. So let's go in that order. Um, I want to ask you, you know, your your definition of inclusion because there, there's SB one 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 three going on right now in the state, and there's been a an ongoing discussion to so what is this inclusion? Uh, schools say that they provide kids um, you know, a, um, a uh, um, individualized, uh, least restrictive environment, but the, the law says there's no individualized, least restrictive environment. There's only one uh, LRE, and that's the general ed curriculum. But many times we, we separate these kids with severe disabilities into um, the, into the special ed um, classrooms where they are already um, susceptible to um, neglect, abuse, um, and, uh, and also inappropriate use of, um, of restraint. So um, I'd like to get your, your input on that. So there is a bill that's been introduced. It's called SB 1113, which you refer to, and that's by Senator Ochoa. 
And I'm part of the statewide SELPA organization, as well as the Coalition for Adequate Funding. And we are, co uh, we are supporters of that bill. And the state of California is moving towards inclusion. And that's what Senator Ochoa is advocating for. Currently, right now, our, our system is based off of the least restrictive environment. The least restrictive environment, meaning the least restrictive environment for that individual student currently right now. So the state is moving towards inclusion, meaning they wanna have the, the, the child fully included and we completely support that bill. So. How oh, do we, because right now they still, many times they provide that individualized least restrictive environment, basically for each child, but then the, the IDEA specifies that least restrictive environment is to have these kids with a non-disabled peers um, in the general ed classroom as much as possible, but we are not practicing that way. We still practice segregating these kids into special ed classes. Yeah, there's a lot of um, districts that are moving towards not doing that any longer. There's a lot that are doing co-teaching. There's, um, for an example, one of my school districts in um, Santa Clarita Valley, Castaic Union School District has moved to a full inclusion model where they are doing a learning center. So all of the kids are in general ed classes and they go to a learning center just for support. So districts are moving slowly, but they are moving in that direction. Um, when they say that they should be with their general ed peers to the uh, extent possible, that means that some kids maybe not be able to be in, in with the kids fully. Um, you're talking more of our probably less severe kids, but we do have kids that are like, you know, medically fragile and, and you know, real, real sick children. So um, it is an individualized. So I don't think IDEA is ever going to go away where it's an individualized for each student. But at the same time, they are trying to move and the whole state is moving towards um, full inclusion. That they're pushing that, that, that initiative. Right now, it's not saying that we have to do it, but it's pushing towards that initiative. And I will tell you that the state of California is suffering um, out of compliance in the area of least restrictive environment. Remember in the beginning of this presentation, I told you I'm over compliance as well. So our state as a whole is weak in least restrictive environment, meaning that we have our students in special day classes or receiving special education more than we have them in the general ed population. So it is a huge issue for our state. Terry, do you want to unmute and go next? Sure. Um, Tracy, um, I don't know if you know about our Cars Plus um, dark organization. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to have you talk next year at our conference. So oh, I may wow. get in touch with you, but if people want to know about special education, that's what we're working with and with um, the assembly and stuff like that, because that's a group that got the 28 one in mm -hmm. the RSP class. Right. So we're trying to work on the SDC if they're still going to have some. It can't be everybody in all at once. Right. Because I spent a lot of time in Compton for 16 years teaching in a special day class mm. and RSP and yes. that. And my kids, I taught them what the kids needed to know. Everything was done by, you know, for them. Right. So. Yeah, I would love to. You have my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. But I am wholeheartedly, I believe that we need to make sure that we put our kids in the least restrictive environment. So we mainstream them as much as possible, include them as much as possible. If and you know, but the whole key is also educating, supporting and, and providing that education and that support for our teachers. Because you know, this has been done this way for so long that oftentimes yeah. they're afraid just to even get them in the classroom. And it's like they're they're kids. There are all kids. They're all our kids. <laughs> I know. <laughs> They're all, I always called them my kids. So yeah. And if anyone wants to know about the organization, which is great, you can become a member and get all this information and find out what we're doing with the legislature. And I'd like to talk with you later about the legislation too. Oh, absolutely. I'm very I'm with the legislature. We just had our legislative sharing day last month, uh, last week actually on Tuesday, and I met with several legislators. So especially uh, Senator Ochoa. So that was why I'm so thank you. <laughs> Terry, could you put the website in the chat for everybody too, please? Yes, I will. Excellent. 
And so that's the California Association for Resource Specialists. I love it. And special educators, it's anyone that works with, I want it to be not only special ed, but general ed, because you we know, all need that's, it. That's the key, right? They, general education needs to know. Mm -hmm. needs and to if each district sends 10 teachers, I will give them a deal of $4,000 where they can just pay 4000 for 10 people to come. And we make a three-course meal, so lunch. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it'll be up there shortly on the website okay i see rosa's hands up again and i just want to there was a somebody a comment in the chat that i think is great thank you so much this really helps my family and i out with my 10 year old sister who has sld oh. so it's nice when it's practical it is. you're gonna head in the next room and gonna use it right away <laughs> so i yep. love that i love that good, good. Rosa, what would you like to ask or share well, for me, I I have three nephews. I have one who's um, visually impaired and he has Down syndrome. And I have two that are autistic. So my, my drive to be a special needs educator is because I am actively in participating with everything. I go to their doctor's appointments. I go to their specialists. I go everywhere with my sister-in-law's because I want to be able to provide them the same support here in my home as they get in theirs. But I've realized that sometimes, like even with me studying at my college, there's a lack of support when it comes to going into special education. Cause I know that for me, I'm getting my special education um, certificate, but I'm also working to become a elementary teacher to work side by side both. Um, but I know that when it comes to that, I, I always get discouraged because everybody's telling me, oh, it takes too long. It takes too long. Just concentrate on this area. And I feel like that's one thing that is discouraging in certain schools, that they're not supportive of it. And there's lack of classes. Because I transferred colleges because my college only had one <laughs> special education right. class. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Fullerton has five. Right. So I feel like that's one thing that I've, I've voiced with my college that I feel like there should be more stuff to prepare us if we want to go that route, mm -hmm. instead of just having more elementary regular classes, mm -hmm. opposed to having us because a lot of the stuff that I do on the site, I do it because I want to do it. It's not because right. my school is helping me with it. Right. I'm looking for those resources myself. Tracy, I know people are struggling to find places that you can get a combined multiple subject and special ed credentials simultaneously. And I've got to tell you, I, I don't know of that many. I think like Long Beach or Fullerton, one of them has an agreement and they have it. Mm -hmm. I think like Grand Canyon University, like online, but do you, it's not, you would think it'd be all over that we would try to have these blend where you can have both credentials. So then you can go back and forth, you know, but I yeah. don't know. Do you know of any programs that people might want to yeah. consider looking into? I really don't know of any programs. I think that's where I struggle a lot too, Rosa and, and Renee, is that, you know, we're not preparing people or we're not advocating because there's a shortage. There's a shortage nationwide pretty much, but there's a shortage in California of teachers, not just special ed teachers, but of educators. So there's something that's really not going on. And I know that they are reshaping the credential now for this so I don't know if it's if it's going to be a combination or it, you know it, it sounds like it's just for qualified you know making a that has some type of bridge program for you know uh, for them to be able to do the specialty area areas but um, it's it, it it is a it is something Rosa that we do need to encourage and 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 train and support you know more I do attend a lot of um the uh, community advisory committee meetings at CSUN. I do that at least twice a year. And I go and I just say, look, we, we need teachers. Are you, are you guys, are, are you training them? Are you pre preparing for them? You know, this is what they need because we do, you know, our teacher, student teacher stuff here and so forth, but it's, we're just not getting, we're just not getting a lot. Do you feel like some colleges, like I know that, for example, where I'm going, there's like 20 classes I can take but there's some colleges that are just offering six. Do you feel like they're training them less 
opposed to other schools? That probably wouldn't be a, um, a question that I can answer because I'm really not following the universities or the colleges as much, to be honest. Um, I I'm kind of do the neighboring ones near me only because it's easier to try to get them to come and do some of the student teaching and then hire them on. But as far as like all of the other colleges, I'm not really sure what's happening out there, but listening to you and listening to others in the field, I'm finding that that's what I hear. I hear that they're struggling getting classes. You're also gonna see that if they, like if the college offers a master's degree option in special education, there'll be more offerings than if they do not offer a master's degree. And so that could be it either it, whether you're on the master's pathway or not, it could just be that's why there's more or less available, but there is not consistency with the number of classes that are offered. There's not, I know that for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's not like you're going to go to one place and do a much shorter program. They're going to be similar in length, but the content that you get may vary depending on where you go. There are certain pieces that are required, but then there's some flexibilities in terms of the other parts of the training that you go through. Rosa, I agree with you. Not all the Cal States offer special ed and it's unfortunate, but yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. I, I got offered an internship at USC, but for just regular teaching, not special ed. And when I told them, no, this is what I want. They're like, well, then you're going to have, we don't offer that. They well, you me. stick with it, Rosa, you stick with it. I'll tell you a good college is, um, uh, LA. It's over by the Diagnostic Center. I'm trying to think which college that one is. Los Angeles. Um, I can't think of the college. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. Is it but I know Cal it's, it's State LA. LA something. Huh? Cal is State Cal LA. State LA? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Cal State LA offer, offers a, a good um, visually impaired program. And also O&M. Uh, you know, I'll talk about a little bit of that stuff too at my training on, on uh, Thursday. But yeah. Tracy, isn't it challenging to also get training for deaf and hard of hearing? I feel like CSUN has it, but I don't think it's all over, correct? No, it's not all over. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had, st I'm struggling with that too. I have, I have to, like, I'm with the Braille, I had to take it at a Braille Institute here near my home because none of my schools had like that. Where do you live, um, Rosa? What area? I live in I live near Koreatown in LA. Oh, in LA. Okay. And yeah, the Braille and the Braille Institute is just right here near um Santa Monica. It's an actual school next to a college where so I have to go there. And if when I wanted to learn more about autism um techniques and how to educate for my nephews, I had to go to another one over there by Long Beach. Yeah. Oh. It was, it's like having to go to different places all the yeah, time. Exactly. Lily also asked in the chat about, do we know any one year masters of counseling programs? I don't know any one year, Tracy, off the top of my head. I'm not sure if you do. And for me, I know it's because the amount of hours that are required to get a master's yeah. in counseling, it's, mm -hmm. it requires a bit, a lot, like a significant lab component. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the reasons I've never heard of a one year, but have you by any chance? I have not heard of a one year, never, no. And I actually have mine in counseling also, and it was not one year. <laughs> so yeah, not, I mean, you know, things could change that maybe after you have maybe your master's degree or something, maybe there's a one year that you can get some type of, you know, certification for it. I have no idea though. Uh, yeah, Lily, you just asked in education. I know of some colleges where you can get a teaching credential in one year mm -hmm. and then your all your credential classes count towards your master's. Um, but this is not all of them, but I know certain ones where then what happens is you get up to five years to take like four or five more online classes. And once you complete those classes, which personally, I think you should do as soon as possible, because if you're going to teach K-12, the more education you have, the more you get paid. Always remember that you want to max yourself on that scale. And so um, there, so there's ways that you can get a credential in one year. And sometimes a credential and master's, though, they're hard to find. Um, and they're not usually at CSU. CSUs don't do combined credential and master's. They do combine bachelor's and credential. 
And so um, a lot of times, if you're looking at a CSU, you have to do your credential and master separately, but there's mm -hmm. other options where you can do them at the same time. And I highly suggest you do them at the same time. <laughs> yeah, Rosa, you're doing an aggressive two-year program. It's a lot of work. One thing though, I saw that you said you're in, going into an ITEP program. Make sure you ask them how many of those units in their program are gonna be post-baccalaureate because your salary is only contingent upon all of the units you have past a BA. So if the ITEP program keeps your units under your BA, then that means you're gonna to have to go back to school to get additional units in order to progress on the salary schedule. So you wanna ask them how many of the units in your program are gonna be considered post-baccalaureate. And Rosa, if you need help with that, like in phrasing it, I can help you um, at some point by all means, because we wanna make sure everybody is paid well coming into this field. Yeah, I my my thing is that after I'm done right now with my with my AA, I'm gonna I gonna go. I already got accepted to um, Cal State Fullerton for that ITEP from mild to moderate. So all the work I'm doing now is so I don't have to do too much work with them. So I because I want to be in the classroom, I want to do hands on learning. So that's what I don't. They they offered me if you if I'm willing to do the two years, it's gonna be aggressive opposed to four, but I'm, I want to get in a classroom already. That's my thing. Good. I love your tenacity there. <laughs> and you're needed. I can tell yes. you for sure you'll get hired before you're even done with your credentials. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> Just keep coming to things like this and letting people know who you are. Because when the time comes that you're looking for a position, we can also, all, like, oh, there's a lot of us that can help you. Okay, that's one thing that I like. I'm, I'm debating because I'm right now. I'm attending two colleges. I'm attending Fullerton and Santa Ana because some classes are not at Fullerton; they're at Santa Ana, and I'm doing both because I want to have as much of my classes under my belt. I don't see it as. I know some of my friends don't like the fact that I'm taking more classes at times, but I feel like the better prepared I am, the better it is for my students. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that a lot of the reason I found out about Teach LA and your seminars is because somebody else invited me, but my teacher pathway program did not give any of us these links or um, this information. And I feel like it's a big disservice to a lot of us. Rosa, one of the reasons why we offer this is because many of us who were in teacher prep programs were never offered anything. And so when we get the opportunity to create things, we create what we never got and what the <laughs> gaps that we had mm -hmm. in the hopes that the next generation does not have gaps. There's a reason we offer everything for free. There's a reason we're trying to record everything. There's a reason why we put, you know, put everything on Zoom. Just keep sharing with your friends and your colleagues that the Teach LARC, we're a free resource that all we wanna do is help you to become educators, that's all. And so, you know, keep following us, keep track of our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram or Facebook or whatever social platform you're on and just stay connected and share with others because that's the or that's a, one of the biggest origins of Teach LARC. We have three of us or four of us who lead the project. One who wanted to be a teacher and never got a chance to because somebody screwed up their pathway Another one who should have been able to be an educator in about three years and it took her nine years. And then me, I love being an educator and I've been paying off my student loans for over 25 years because I, I didn't have enough money to go to school. And so guess what? I don't want you to be paying off loans for 25 years. <laughs> and so that's why we're always, we're always put, taking all these pieces and put it together. Right, Tracy? I mean, it's what it right. comes down to. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. So keep sharing everybody. Any, I know we're getting like, we're late on time here, but I also see that Alejandra, um, I made an offer. If you would be interested in me doing a workshop this summer on salary, I could absolutely explain K through 12 salary and how it works and how you maximize yourself and how you be strategic. I maxed out on my salary schedule by my second year of teaching. And so I made the most money I could possibly make within the first two years, and, but I had to be strategic. And so um, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, absolutely, Rosa. I see Alejandra. Absolutely. I can, I'll talk to you, dear, and we'll get it booked. The nice thing is it's me. So we can, it'll be easy to book it. <laughs> um, any other questions we have for Tracy? Thou, I see your hands up if you'd like to unmute. 
Uh, yeah, two. Um, one is, uh, uh, first question is for Renee. Um, we have this recording and the slides with Tracy's uh, information to be sent to us uh, for us to look at. Absolutely. You know what we're doing, Tao, is we're, we're putting up the recordings on two different locations. We have the Teach LA YouTube channel, and then we also have a website that's our statewide website. And that one, um, that's where we're putting all the slide decks. So give me like another minute and then I'll put, I'll drop that in the chat. And if for some reason we wrap before I'm able to drop it in the chat, just shoot me an email and then I'll absolutely give you the link. Um, it usually takes us about 24 hours or so to upload the video. So not too long, but within the next day or so, we'll absolutely have it up for people. And also Tracy and I, just so everybody knows, we've yeah. been buddies for a long time. Like we got a master's degree together, like, I don't know, 17 years ago, a long <laughs> time ago, was. one yeah, of our master's degrees. And yeah. so we became like, you know, buddies. We even taught, well, we were both in the same district together 20 years right. ago. Mm -hmm. So I can help you reach Tracy at any time. time. Yep. Okay, don't worry. I'm available. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get that link right now if we have another question or two. And like I said, if we end up wrapping, then just email me and I'll shoot it to everybody later. Tracy, what is your master's in again? I, I missed that slide. I know. My master's in, is in educational psychology and counseling, counseling and school psychology. And then I also have one in, in um, educational leadership and administrative credential. Yeah, I, cause, uh, so I'm always doing a part of my class at Fresno City College. I was planning to do my credential at Cal State LA because Cal State LA um, master's program, they give you the credential while you work on your master's class. Basically, you could work on your credential while taking these yeah. master classes. Mm -hmm. But then, because I, I moved, um, I moved to Fresno. So, the only uh, school out here, actually, only two schools out here uh, that offer the uh, special ed, master's of special education, is uh, one, of the one of the two schools is Fresno State. Fresno now, with Fresno State, they, um, they require you to, uh, to come in already with, um, with a credential. So um, I don't have a credential. So basically, of course, the Cal State LA program is a better option for me, but because I moved, they said that you're, um, so I'm actually in the master's program right now at Fresno State, um, but they cannot give me the credential. So by the end of next year, they will give me my master's, but no credential. So I feel, um, I feel a little bit discouraged in this process. And as I learn more about the special education journey, I find out that, when teachers want to see something right, um, like one to at the IEP meeting where um, call something out of place because they don't, have, they don't have much of that say. Usually the administrator looks at the draft of the IEP and will have that final say. So let's say a teacher knows that a child should get um, this type of service, but the child, but the student cannot call it out because if she does, she will lose her job. So it gave me, so it made me realize I, I want to do special ed, but also realize that if you cannot advocate for a child because of administration um, hovering over your head, um, I, I it had me wondering uh, many but, times. You know, it just depends on where you're at. That's bad practice. Um, that's not the way that it's supposed to go. Um, a, 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 a IEP is based off of you know assessments and goals are driven. Uh, their services are driven by the goals that the student needs in order to, um, you know, achieve. And when you have a, a IEP meeting, it's an IEP team decision. So that means that everybody that is at that table is supposed to make the decision. It's not one sole person that does that. And not, I, I'm not aware of anybody that could just be fired because they, um, you know, didn't follow what the administration said over an IEP. Because the IEP is, is a, is a, is a, uh, um, a team decision. Yeah, it's a very important document. So I spend like most of my time with the uh, Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates because to really know more about the law because in my special education program, they don't really go, they don't really go over the law. So I would have to go the extra mile to learn about the special education laws. And as I read more about these case studies, I realize how, how much of our kids are, um, are deprived um, because they're not getting the services that they're supposed to get. Parents don't know how to advocate. They don't know what, they don't know how to ask a question because no one really um, taught them about the, um, the IP process, the laws, their rights uh, at these IP meetings. So, um, but um, I, I, I don't know if, if, um, 
given the fact that I am almost done with this cat with this uh, with this, the masters by end of next year, if if it's even worth it to really, it's um, worth it. Don't be discouraged. It's worth it. I think maybe you need to go into other areas and probably do some volunteering or going observing or whatever, because obviously probably where you're at, it, it's it's not the way it is everywhere. You can even come into my cell phone and you can see we have fabulous IEPs. We do what we are called, you know, facilitated IEPs now within this cell phone. And that's called um, a, faci a facilitated IEP means that everybody is going to be involved. It's not like, you know, it, it's not a top heavy type of um, IEP, like the way that you're describing. Uh, yeah you know, and it's written based off of what the student needs and they're mainstreamed out. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different process than the experience that you are describing to me right now. Okay. So don't be discouraged. <laughs> don't be discouraged. I am mean, almost done. So like just one more year, I'm done with a master's, but cannot really go in because I don't have a credential because the way it's personally set up. So it's a, uh, it's very, uh, you put all this hard work and then now you cannot really, uh, really go out in the field because you don't have a credential in place. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I was more astute on the different programs and, and credentialing and colleges and stuff. And I'm, I'm really not. But I know that because there is such a need, there are so many places that you could go in and, and, and get credentials, you know, that they are, they, they'll probably hire you to get the credential. <laughs> they would hire you and yes. then you could go into an intern program through uh -huh. like California or through all sorts. They, they, they need enough special ed teachers that you could go in with a master's and they would take you right away and get you some in some sort of program for that credential piece. I wanted to also share with you, please go meet with Fresno Pacific University I actually am working with FPU on a project right now, and they are incredibly collaborative. They're incredibly student focused. And another thing that's fascinating, they understand that they're one of their main competitors is a CSU. And so they're also talking about ways to be competitive in terms of their tuition and what they offer future teachers in this in the in the Fresno and Clovis community. So please consider go talking or to go talk to Fresno Pacific University. Um, and if you need a contact, let me know. I know of somebody wonderful named Nicole and I'm spacing out on her last name right now, but we've met each other. I've actually been a keynote at Fresno uh, Pacific University um, in fall. I got to see everybody face to face. So if I can be of help connecting you, please let me know because they might be a good option. And if that doesn't seem like a good match, I'd call Fresno Unified and say, and talk to the, the director of special ed and say, here's my situation. I want to come work for you. What do I need to do once I finish this master's degree? And then they might go, oh, here's, we want you to sign up in this this year. Let's get your credential at the same time. So I would talk directly to the LEAs and just see what you can find out from them. Like just, I'd start with Fresno Pacific and then I'd go over to Fresno Unified. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to reach out to you then, Renee, so after this. Huh? Absolutely. And don't be shy with this kind of stuff. Don't feel like, am I stepping over turf? Or No, no, no. Trust yeah. me, if, they, if you go to them and say, I'm finishing a master's in special ed and I don't have a credential, but I want to be a teacher for you, they're going to be like, let's meet tomorrow and uh, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Are there any other questions that we have? Tracy, thank you so much for staying on so long tonight. I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful that you're coming back later this week too, um, because Forward this is such it. a good area and you're such a fantastic presenter and um, we need more good special ed teachers. And we so do, we really need, and I'm telling you this group that was on here today, I just wanna applaud you all also, because like I said, just the, the heart that you have for our students and even wanting to consider going into the field or are in the field, that's just amazing and it's wonderful to have. And again, Thou, we don't want you to get discouraged at all. We need you. So there will be ways and avenues to be able to get you in. So don't be discouraged. You know, Tracy, I've, uh... I've done a lot of schooling. So this was actually uh, a change in uh, my career pathway. Mm -hmm. So after I uh, worked with one special ed child, then I realized that now this is something I wanted to do to fix a, a broken system. But just trying to get in uh, and almost done and to have to uh, you know, do uh, to go another uh, route to get that credential, it, it's, it's, uh, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite unexpected. 
Gracie, I'm sorry. I meant to mute me and I muted you. And then I couldn't <laughs> you. I'm sorry. It's been a long one. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you again. And you have a wonderful evening, the rest of your night, rather. <laughs> thank you so much, Tracy. And we'll see you on Thursday. So hopefully everybody can come back on Thursday night. We also have California's Teacher of the Year doing a two-hour workshop on Thursday during the day. So, um, And we have a science early childhood ed workshop on Friday or Thursday as well. So okay. we're getting to this very end of it, everybody. We've got one workshop next week and then we go quiet for a while. So thank you for being here. I know it's a lot to continue your professional learning. We are proud of you and we're watching you and we wanna hire you. So please keep doing what you're doing. Tracy, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Everybody have a wonderful night. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Take care.